Hello, Alaska. Hello, America. Welcome to Stand. This is a no fear zone. That means the fear stops here. I'm your host, Kelly Chewbacca, a former candidate for U.S. Senate in the state of Alaska. I'm joined today by my amazing co-host and husband, Nikki Chewbacca, who formerly worked at the Department of Justice as a civil rights attorney. We are broadcasting today from the frontier of Alaska and happy to do so even though it's cold. Subscribe now to Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. We're on all your favorite podcast platforms. You can find them on standshow.org. If you leave a review, you could be entered to win our Hydro Flask sticker for the week. So buckle in today for a fantastic lineup. We're kicking off the show with the amazing Bill O'Reilly. He is a seasoned journalist, a best-selling author, and of course a staple in all of our living room homes as he dominated cable news for decades. He's known for his incisive commentary and, of course, his fearless approach to asking questions on tough topics. Bill O'Reilly shaped our national conversation and, of course, our thought life for decades, and he, we will be diving into his insights, his career, and his amazing new book called Killing the Witches. Bill, we're so happy to have you with us. Welcome to Stand. My pleasure. I love Alaska, and I appreciate you guys having me in. Well, you're one of the few people we've talked to who have actually been here and been here several times. We'd love to have you back. I want to kick off the show today and ask, of all the amazing things you've done in your life, which our audience is quite familiar with you, what would you say is your greatest accomplishment? You know, I've uh, been in journalism 49 years. It will be in January. And um, I have succeeded on every level for one reason only. I'm honest. I don't pull any nonsense or I don't have an agenda. And I've been able to adhere to that. It hasn't been easy. Uh, I've had to leave companies that wanted me to do things I wouldn't do. Um, and um, I've stood the test of time. So that's my proudest accomplishment that all of my peers that I began with way back in 1975 um, they're all retired driving around Florida in little golf carts, <laughs> but I'm still <laughs> here and doing what I do. And I appreciate that you have me on your podcast. Well, we're so glad to have you here. I love that you answer that question, not with something that you did, but with a character statement that you, you stood by your values. And I think it's also interesting to your point that all these other people who in normal stage of life would be retiring and going to golf courses it's your honesty, your integrity, and I think your pursuit of truth that keeps you motivated to continue doing what you're doing. But you also kind of tipped your hat to this, and I want to follow up on it. Uh, it's also gotten you into some hot water. So you're, you pioneered a new form of journalism, I'd say, that you uh, went into courageous conversations and doggedly pursued truth. That sort of honest approach um, led you to ask questions of guests that were a little bit different than how predecessors had asked them. And that new form of journalism got you into some hot water and into some tough times in your career and in life. And I just wanted to ask, how did you handle some of those tough times? Well, I'm a realistic pragmatist, so I always know um, who is on my side and who isn't. And you can't control that. Um, you have to be a person who sees the whole field, to use a sports cliche. So when I began uh, the cable news adventure in 1995, I had just come off a Harvard uh, master's degree in public administration. I designed the O'Reilly Factor up at Harvard because I knew that technology was going to lead to big corporations um, setting up 24-hour television news, which had never been done before. And I knew that that was coming in a big way. Now, CNN was first, um, but the Fox model was traditional Americans, not just conservatives, but traditional people. They don't have much of a voice on television, so we'll give them one. And it worked in a tremendous way. And so I was there for more than 20 years. Every day of my life, I was attacked. Uh, primarily by left-wing people and, you know, as the technology grew up, the websites and all of those people, well-funded, money coming into them, um, you know, destroy people with whom you disagree. Um, and then basically I had some protection 
but that protection broke down at the end. And so I decided, look, I'm not fighting any of this. I'm going to form my own news agency, which I have. BillOReilly.com is where we live. And it is the most successful independent news agency in the world. Hmm. Took me seven years to establish it, but we have. And believe me when I tell you, I am a lot better off as a person, as a journalist in every way, working for myself hmm. and not from corporate pinheads, you know? Well, that, that actually leads to my question, Bill. I mean, Kelly talked about how you've been, you pioneered new trends, uh, new horizons in journalism, always on the edge uh, of, of journalistic thought and um, trends. Your thoughts on journalism today, uh, what are you, what, you're watching now from the outside looking in in terms of corporatist journalism. What are your thoughts on where it is right now and where do you think we're headed? Well, it's horrible. It's corrupt. We all know it. Everybody knows it. Audiences have declined dramatically across the board. Um, Fox News still beats MSNBC and CNN. But when I left my last quarter at Fox, I was averaging about six million viewers a night. Wow. Um, yeah, about 900,000 in the 24 to 54 um, demographic where they sell advertising off of. It's half that now. Mm -hmm. um, so we all know that when you uh, speak to the choir and you don't really, you know, mix it up the way I did, you know, the, the problem is it's boring. So the cable shows bring on people, the hosts who agree with them. There is no fire. There's no very little of that anymore. It's too hard to do. And um, the future of it is going to continue to descend uh, as people get bored with it. Uh, only older people watch network news. That's totally deteriorated. You could go out in Anchorage, Alaska tonight and say, who's the lead anchor man for ABC Evening News? Maybe okay. one out of five people would be able to tell you that. When I worked there under Peter Jennings, everybody in the country knew who Peter Jennings right. was. So different. Yeah. And part of my concern as I'm watching this trend is what happens to the viewers, the audiences? How do we find and discern what's true and what's not? Because the tendency in human beings is to just gravitate to your own little bubble, right? So you could foresee right. a situation where uh, things become more proliferated. We have a more sort of democratic way of doing journalism. But then you, it, it sort of reflects the great divide, right, in our country where people on the left will just listen to leftist podcasts, et cetera. People on the right will just listen to folks on the right and will never have a way to figure out, like, what's what's really true and you know watching your podcast that's something where people can feel comfortable knowing bill's going to sh shoot straight with us and give it to us straight but where else could people go how else do they curate <laughs> all these new media uh, platforms out there well here's what i do uh, I get the Wall Street Journal and about five other newspapers uh, delivered every morning to my house on Long Island. The journal editorial section is honest. Um, their information is uh, usually checks out, about 90% of it checks out. And then I go to uh, Semaphore, H-S uh, as in Sam, E-M-A-F-O-R. It's an internet news site. Pretty good. Pretty good. And there's a new one called Tangle, T-A-N-G-L-E. The guy's trying. So I amass my information in the morning, and then I have my producers go out and confirm. All right? So we're on pretty solid ground every day when we broadcast, not only to our television, but we have more than 300 radio stations that we broadcast on as well. We're pretty solid that what we're telling you is true. But it is a absolutely you have to want to find the truth. And it's not easy. And a lot of people don't even want to find it. They feel comfort in the bubble on both sides. And that that is a problem for America. Well, you just gave us a couple of resources I had never even heard of. So mm -hmm. to our audience. So helpful. Yeah. Check check those out. 
and uh, continue to watch Bill on uh, his show as well, and you won't go wrong in figuring out what's really going on out there. Uh, last quick question. we got a, a minute here, Bill. You've had a really interesting and varied career. You've done, you've been an educator, uh, policy person, journalist. How did you figure out where you wanted to go ultimately and what did you want to dedicate your life to? I mean, you spent 50 years in journalism. How did you decide this is what I want to do? Well, I'm a believer in God. And, but I'm not a holy roller kind of person. But one of the tenets of my religion, Roman Catholicism, is there is an act of God. And if you believe in that God, you will get guided by uh, an entity called the Holy Spirit. Every human being is born with talent. Even the people who are mentally challenged, uh, everybody has talent. And I learned early in life what my talent was. I could always write. I never took a writing class, and I'm Irish. I can bloviate like crazy, blind, <laughs> right? I knew that. So all I did was combine the two and got into journalism, television mm -hmm. journalism, all right? That's what everybody has to do. What do you do well? And then you develop that skill to the highest level, and you will succeed. That's a phenomenal answer and remembering that our our lives are guided by a higher force a higher power um, and using our abilities to the best uh, that we can and for for his glory after the break we're going to dig into bill's new book killing the witches killing the witches it's an amazing uh, new book in his uh, series the killing series we'll be right back with that remember to describe subscribe to the show while we're on break and uh, check out the book online, buy it anywhere uh, books are sold. You can also find it on BillOReilly.com. We'll be right back. Weka is a private security services company operating in Alaska and across the U.S. with nearly a decade of experience providing personal protection, medical support, surveillance, and facility event armed and transport security. Weka provides state-of-the-art security forces by utilizing current and former law enforcement officers, former military, and medical personnel to provide for a client's needs in all situations. For more information on Weka and its security services, contact 260-337-8263. Welcome back to Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. You're here today with Bill O'Reilly, who has written in this amazing new book, Killing the Witches. It's surging on Amazon. Congratulations, Bill. So we want to talk about this book. It's a fascinating glimpse into what we all know as the Salem Witch Trials, this time in the Puritan journey in Massachusetts. And they went overboard in their quest to get rid of evil. But this is your 13th book in the Killing series. And for those who haven't read or purchased the books, it includes things like Killing Jesus, Killing Lincoln, Killing Kennedy, a really great series of books. I wanted to ask you, though, what inspired you to write this book in particular? Okay, so uh, by the way, you can get all 13 Killing books on BillOReilly.com for Christmas. Um, it's a good deal. And if you really want to know about the world and your country, it's a good investment. And if you don't, you got 13 separate Christmas gifts to give away. <laughs> so you win both ways. So I could write about anything. Um, the Killing Series, a best-selling nonfiction book series in the world. Um, nobody's ever sold more books than we have in this category. And uh, I wanted to write a book that was fascinating in a historical sense, but also relevant to today, Kelly. And the witch hunt today is big. Donald Trump uses the word witch hunt every speech hmm. that he feels he's a victim of a witch hunt. All right. I told one of his guys, I said, look, whenever he says witch hunt, could he hold up the book killing the witches? <laughs> that would be great marketing for me yeah. if he could do that. So there is a modern day witch hunt. And it's exactly the same hmm. as it was in 1692. So. We're not executing people anymore with the rope because all the witches were hung, hanged, but we're destroying their lives. And here's how it works. Back in Salem, Massachusetts, it was a theocracy. It was run by crazy lunatic ministers 
not of any faith. They were just Christian ministers. They didn't even celebrate Christmas or Easter. That's how nutty these people were. And the society was based on, you better do what we tell you to do, or you're going to hell. But before we get to hell, we're going to beat the hell out of you. <laughs> and so right. it was a crazy, crazy society. Well, young girls, 12, 11, they started to accuse people of being witches. And these lunatic judges and clerics took it seriously. And all it would take was an accusation. How do you prove you're not a witch? How do you do that? So the girl goes, oh, goody, so-and-so tried to make me sign the devil's book. Guilty. Oh, it is crazy. Crazy. Today, any accusation, particularly if you're famous or wealthy, gets on page one. And the press doesn't care whether you did it or not. Mm -hmm. They just want the accusation. And then the people, the folks, are going, well, look at he did. Look what he, she did. Wait a minute. Where's due process in this? That's why I wrote the book. So it takes you from actually the Mayflower, which you guys didn't want to be on, by the way. Everybody <laughs> thinks that was a love boat. That was harrowing getting over here on that. It takes you from that all the way up to the present day about the witch hunt. The mm -hmm. witch hunt today is the cancel culture. It's you say something, they'll kill you, and then money. These lawyers advertise on television. Somebody did something to you, you come right to us, and we'll destroy their lives, and we'll get you money. It's a huge industry, and everybody knows it. So I link it all together. I make it relevant to today. Killing the Witches' first two months sold 250,000 copies. Wow. And mm -hmm. in this day and age, where people are addicted to the cell phones, and, they, you know, they're don't read the books the way they used to. <laughs> right. That's phenomenal. Yeah. It That's is phenomenal. phenomenal. Something else I think you did really good in the in the book is you explain part of the reason why this culture was so crazy is because they came over in the Mayflower. We paint this, I don't know, maybe I have a first grade picture of it, of having painted or pictured these boats. We, you know, we colored all the boats and we we dressed up as pilgrims and it was all just joy and happy. But I think you did a really good job of explaining it wasn't actually joy and happy. And by the time they got over here, these people were actually pretty traumatized. And well, then that, that, that just was, carries out forward. Our country, uh, the origins of it were so brutal. Mm -hmm. People just have no clue about how difficult it was to come here. Uh, nothing here uh, except hostile Native Americans who did not want your presence. Um, and most of the pilgrims, they weren't pilgrims, they weren't called that until 100 years later. Um, so it's my duty as a historian to tell the truth about my country, which I love. And you read Killing the Witches and you go all the way through all the mm -hmm. rest, you'll know more about your country than anybody else. Well, one of the things that's true about history is our stories continue. And I think you do a good job of of portraying that, that the seeds of our current culture were actually set at the foundation. And we haven't gotten away from that. And so one of the things I'd like you to explain a little bit more about is this it, this theme you explore in the book of the psychology of fear and the contagious social contagion that is fear, that once it this, um, this un, ungrounded paranoia set in, it just spread. And you saw it all through Salem so much that it becomes a uh, part of history. I love the, how you talk about calling up to the leadership in Salem and, and they're so proud about their Salem witch festivals and everything. And you talk about, do you realize you're glorifying the murder, the ungrounded murder of all these victims? Like, are you really celebrating that? <laughs> and they just go silent. Yeah. And yeah, and then and how that plays today, and what you see in our um, our contagious fear in society today. What do you link those? I'd like to hear your thoughts on the link between those two. Yeah, so back in Salem in 1692, you had children testifying against their parents. Uh, it was like it was horrible, and but some good came out of it because we would not have freedom of religion now had the Salem witch trials not happened, because Benjamin Franklin, hmm. young teenager in Boston, he got onto this thing, and he was so appalled by it. Franklin was a genius, even as a kid. He brought it to the Constitutional Convention, so we can't have 
religious people run in this country. It was a big brawl. Um, uh, Patrick Henry, governor of Virginia, wanted in the Constitution the United States to be defined as a Christian country. And, but Franklin and Madison and Jefferson won that fight. And that's why we have freedom of religion now. Today in our society, religion is on the skids. Uh, it's a secular society. And that's not a good thing, in my opinion, because we need to have some moral foundations of right and wrong. Progressive movement, they don't want that. They don't want to prosecute criminals. They don't want any judgments made. Uh, it's frightening what they, hmm. their vision is. I, I'm a person who believes there is a right and wrong, a good and evil. And those people on a side of good have to fight evil. And in Salem, they couldn't do it because if you went up against these clerics and judges, then the next day you were accused of being a witch. Hmm. Now we have a bit more protection on that. But still, you go against the media in this country, they're going to come after you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's powerful. And following up on that, Bill, we've got a couple minutes left with you. And I'm just really curious to hear what's the solution, right? We know uh, one of the solutions is to learn from history. If you learn from history, you're less bound to repeat it. <laughs> but we can see how leftist culture yeah. now is trying to erase or redefine history mm -hmm. so we don't learn from our mistakes from the past. How do we get out of repeating what we're repeating right now in our own functional equivalent of those witch trials in this cancel culture? Well, 2024 election is going to tell the tale. Mm -hmm. If the progressives uh, gain, you can kiss your country goodbye. You know, you guys are in a good place because Alaska is separate, all right? Even though you're uh, affected by the same cultural trends, you're not that close to the madness that centers in Washington, D.C. Americans have got to go to the polls next uh, November, and they don't vote party, but you've got to stop this far left movement. And Joe Biden is a tool of that movement. He enables that movement. They control him. Yeah. Now, I'm, Trump is Trump, okay? You, you guys make your own decision about Trump. But I'm voting against, all right? the progressive movement and all of this cancel culture, all this woke business, that's what I'm voting against next November, because I know how brutal that is, and I want it vanquished. And so all I can tell you is that's how you fight it at the ballot box. Hmm. Hmm. Well, hopefully we, we learn that that lesson because people tend to think, well, they'll go after so-and-so because, you know, they're famous, but they're never going to come after me. And yet more and well, more we're will. seeing everyday uh, ordinary Americans getting caught in those those nets. And um, and we write about that in Killing the Witches. We were regular people. Lives are destroyed. One final point. A lot of Alaskans go down to California, you know, do a little bit weather and stuff like that. If you're a parent in California, a parent, you don't have any rights. Mm -hmm. You have no rights. And people don't know that. They don't know what Sacramento has done, that you can't even raise your own kids. The state will intrude mm -hmm. wow. on, on that. And I mean, if that's what you want, keep voting for Newsom, mm -hmm. keep voting for Biden, because that's what they are promoting. Bill, you make a good I point. I really appreciate you guys uh, having me on. Very nice to talk to you. You um, too. And I, yeah, I you make a good point. All the, the, All of your listen, listeners sorry, and viewers, a very Merry Christmas up in North Pole, Alaska, right? Yeah, that's right. And you make a good point that um, killing the witches and witch trials are really not related to a political party. Um, it doesn't have to be an extreme right or an extreme left. It's really a mindset about control and a contagious, and a contagious fear. So thank you so much for being with us. We really sure. appreciate it. Uh, we'll be right back right, after this break. There. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, when I, when I come up there, I'm going to come into the studio with you guys, all right? We would love that. We'd love to That'd have you awesome. up and to do a book promotion tour because I think this, this book is really prescient and it's a foreshadowing of what's to come on a mass level if we don't take a stand uh, for free speech and courage. So we'll be right back after this break. Thank you so much, Bill O'Reilly, for being with us. Please, everyone, 
check out this book, Killing the Witches. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on BillOReilly.com, along with all the other books in the Killing series. And you're with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca on stand. Right after this break, we'll be coming back with our next guest. So stand by. Make sure to hit subscribe while we're on break. And we'll be right back in just a minute. Africa New Day with mission is actually to create leaders, change a culture, and transform a nation. We believe that this is an area where God wants us to make a difference. You know, He has called us the light of the world. Well, where does the light shine? Where there is darkness. As you pray with us, as you contribute to our efforts, we believe that together we can make a difference. Welcome back from our break. We're excited to welcome Kevin Freeman to the show. Kevin Freeman hosts Economic War Room. It's a weekly broadcast and podcast where financial intelligence meets national security. Economic War Room is a financial news show that provides new market insights to the challenges America and Wall Street face daily. Kevin Freeman has spent decades studying the intersection of economics and national security, and today he's going to join us to talk about the Founders' Hidden Plan for Economic Liberty. Kevin, welcome to Stand. We're so glad to have you with us. Oh, thank you, Kelly. It's an honor to be with you. Uh, I'm so glad to have this discussion with you. I know what we're going to talk about. I've been involved in some of your discussions and mobilization at the state level, but I know that a lot of our audience has no idea what we're going to talk about. So I want to open up with this book you've written, Pirate Money. It's an Amazon bestseller. Yes, audience, you can get it on Amazon. Pirate Money, Discovering the Founder's Hidden Plan for Economic Justice and Defeating the Great Reset. You also can find it on Kevin's website, economicwarroom.com. So for those who may not understand what we're talking about, can you start out with what's the Great Reset? Why are we even going to care about today's topic and pirate money? Well, the Great Reset is a progressive grab bag of ideas that they have promoted to the World Economic Forum through elitists in the United States, actually even sometimes through the Chinese Communist Party, which is essentially intended to take America down as a republic and replace it as just another nation among the world, uh, and really remove America's special status for liberty in the world and put us all kind of under the thumb of the elites. And they're not even shy about sharing it when the World Economic Forum, which is Klaus Schwab and, you know, the Rothschilds and all the big wigs of the world, when they describe it, they say, by the year 2030, you will own nothing and you'll be right. happy about it. You'll eat less meat. You'll start eating bugs. You're going to, I mean, they list all of these things. That is the Great Reset. It is the takeover plans of the elitist to eliminate America as a liberty loving republic. That's a really good way of summarizing it. A lot of people have not heard about this. It's a, a plan, a plan that they hash out in their conferences. Like you said, they're public about it. Um, they have meetings about this. They've been implementing it. And so then we see these um, destructive forces come through, and many would indicate this seems to be right in line with the Great Reset. It seems to be perhaps intentional that this would be for America's um, le reset and leveling, if you will, to make us not a superpower and therefore more easy to control or to be controlled and our economy is one of those things and i think we can all see there's something wrong with it the dollar's crashing our credit has been downgraded um, we've got a recession looming there's the onset of a national digital currency which would be a currency controlled all by the federal government which means that they can make and take away your dollars whenever they want um, I know that you know a lot about that, your show's about that, but that there, you've said, hey, the founders all anticipated this, government control of our bank accounts, and they had a hidden plan. Um, tell us more about that. Well, first, I'll give you a little history of money, because the World Economic Forum is called economic because it's about money. The sure. Bible talks about money. You know, Luke 16, 11, uh, Jesus said, if you can't get the money part right, if you're not faithful with your unrighteous mammon, no one will trust you with true riches. And unfortunately, Americans are obsessed with money. And that's, 
you know, we are one quarter of the world's economy with 4% of the world's population. So the World Economic Forum says, hey, that's not fair. It's not equitable. We've got to level all that out. But funny how at the top of it, they seem to be in control. And so what they're talking about is taking control in those areas with money. And the founders actually knew that elitists are the same, whether it's the Brit the British monarchy of the uh, of the 17th and 18th century, or whether it is the elitist aristocrats, modern aristocrats on Wall Street and in Davos around the world today, they knew that they would take and control people with money. So that that's the that's the baseline premise of it. Right. What, what they what they did though, is they put in the Constitution a secret plan that we would not go into paper money. I have right here, this is a Continental produced in 1776. Uh, it is a $4 Continental from wow. Philadelphia. They produced this and they paid for the war with it. And George Washington once said, a wagon load full of Continentals would not buy a wagon full of supplies because even though it was supposed to be backed by four Spanish mill dollars, and this is an actual Spanish mill wow, dollar, 0.77 ounces, troy ounces <laughs> of fine silver, uh, even though it was supposed to be backed by four of those, they didn't have a penny to back up their currency. And the net result was massive inflation during the Revolutionary War, a collapsing wow. economy, great challenges. And that's why at Valley Forge, the soldiers you know, a third of them didn't even have shoes. They wore burlap sacks at Valley Forge with bleeding feet, crossing to go to the Delaware. We almost did not survive as a nation because we had unbacked paper money. Net result, founders hated it. Elitists, on the other hand, love it. They love a printing press where they can control people with money. Mm -hmm. And their, their goal is to take away our paper dollars, replace it with this central bank digital currency to where it's all electronic. You don't even have paper money and they can make it turn it on or off at will. They can take it away from you and give it to somebody else. They can tell you you're, you're a bad person because you're buying gasoline. And so your, your money doesn't work to buy gasoline, but it can buy an electric car or it can buy bugs to eat. Or if you're, if you're too heavy and have too high a cholesterol, you can't buy a cheeseburger, but you can buy a salad. It is even such Kelly, wow. that when they talked about this recently at the G20 meeting, they had an interview and they, and one lady came out and said, can you imagine the good we can do with this? If someone's already had two cups of coffee that day and they go to buy a third cup, we can cut them off and their money won't be able to buy a third cup of coffee because they don't need the extra caffeine. And isn't this great what we can do for people? And she said it with a straight face. You know, that's really interesting because at the end of the day, somehow I, I think that in this whole plan for a great reset, those uh, elitists aren't going to be the ones eating the bugs. <laughs> I think they're going to be planning that for everybody else, but not necessarily for themselves. And, you know, what's particularly diabolical about all this is you can see how you could really have a planned economy that's totally controlled by the government. If mm -hmm. you can control what people spend, where they spend, how they spend, when they spend. Uh, it's not just about their physical health or mental health. It's also about what do we need to do to make sure the economy meets the objectives that we think are important? And the only way to do that is to stymie the liberties and the freedoms of the people that we supposedly are trying to, to, to help and whose lives we're supposedly trying to make better. Uh, Kevin, you're an expert on economics and national security. In your opinion, what strategies do you believe the U.S. should adopt to protect its economic interests and its national security at this moment? Well, I'll go back to the prior question and tie them together. The founders said that a federal government, whatever they do about money, a state can only make gold and silver coins. This is a partial, wow. partial gold doubloon. This is a silver piece of eight. And when you hear the term pieces of eight, and gold doubloons, instantly you think Captain Jack Sparrow or you think Treasure <laughs> Island, you think pirate money. 
What we should do is we should adopt pirate money. Imagine if you were paid, you work hard all, all week long, you get your paycheck at the end of the week, and instead of giving you paper dollars that could become worthless, your company gives you gold and silver coins, but they deposit them directly into an account at the state of Alaska or the state of Texas or the state of Utah. They deposit them directly, and then they give you something like this, a debit card that you can use, that you mm. can spend in ounces of gold and silver, or you could write a check on it, or you could show up and say, give me my coin. I want, I want my bullion out. That's the premise of the book Pirate Money. It defeats the Great Reset. It, it takes us off of this debt trap that we're on. It's optional. It's individual. It's offered at the state level. It's constitutional. It's biblical. It meets all of the requirements. So to protect the interests of the United States, we need to get off of this in hyperinflationary schedule that someday will take us to where Zimbabwe was, whereas right. in Zimbabwe, they were once producing $100 bills, and this is a $100 Zimbabwe bill from 1995, and by 2008, they were producing $100 trillion oh bills. And this one had a buying power of $20 US, this one has the buying power of a penny. That's wow. how what hyperinflation does. So we need to return to what the founders said, get rid of this crazy paper money system and $33.5 trillion in debt and go back to real money, gold and silver on a state-based level, mm -hmm. optional to individuals. That's a fascinating idea. And I think, you know, that example and that picture of what happened in Zimbabwe under um, Mugabe is a, a, per, a, a perfect example of what happens when you don't have a currency that's backed uh, by gold yeah. and silver. Uh, let's dig into this a little bit more uh, after this break. We're on stand with Kevin Freeman, author of Pirate Money. You can pick it up on Amazon or on his website, like Kelly said, at economicwarroom.com. We'll be back in a moment. Stand by. We are back on stand with economy expert Kevin Freeman. If you did not get a chance to watch this episode because you're listening to it, I really encourage you to check out that first segment and just the cool pirate money, if you will, original currency that Kevin was holding up because it's amazing to see. I mean, I can't remember the last time I saw a dime or a nickel, let alone old currency, right? So those are some pretty amazing coins to see. Um, Kevin, I really like that you don't just talk about problems. You actually hustle to implement solutions, and you've been working on implementing these solutions. I think I can see a lot of challenges to implementing um, the solutions you're talking about. One of the challenges we run into in Alaska is, while I love the idea of a gold-backed currency or gold and silver, we're not allowed to touch our minerals. Uh, another challenge that I hear you talking about is this would be a state-based system. There's 50 of those <laughs> instead of one federal government. Um, so how have you gone about working to implement this as a solution? I know you've been really busy. Yeah, so we wrote the book. First off, we tried this in Texas in the uh, last session, mm -hmm. and we got amazing support. Both Democrats and Republicans liked it. Wow. Uh, we broke out of uh, committee. It was entered by a freshman. I convinced a freshman House member to enter this as legislation, and they said it's dead. Freshmen can never take anything anywhere ever. Uh, bring it back twice or three times, and we might look at it. But a freshman got it out of the State Affairs Committee, which is the hardest committee in the House, right. got it out of calendars, and got it onto the floor. Wow. And then we, we impeached our attorney general, and oh, we had a whole yeah. bunch of stuff going on. And so it, it got chubbed out at the last second. But we had the votes. We counted them. And the reason is, when we walked into a Democrat's office, we just said, would you all like to own gold? And everybody says, yeah, I would like to own some. How do you buy it? In fact, how to buy gold was the number one search term on Google, according to the Wall Street Journal in April of this year. How to buy gold, number one top Google search term. Mm. The reason is, is people are scared, inflation, central bank digital currency, uh, they want something to hold its value, so they're worried. So how do I buy gold? And they said, the problem with gold is you can't buy a movie ticket with it or go out to dinner with it. It's, it's just not practical. 
But what we said then to the Democrat office is, would you like to own gold and have the ability to spend it or get paid in it and use it as currency? Yes, as an option, as an option, as a choice. Right. They, they know how hard it is. I have a client that passed away. Uh, she uh, had three rolls of gold coins in her safe. Brilliant, beautiful lady lives in Chicago and we liquidated her securities and we sold her house. We opened the safe and we found three rolls of gold coins. We estimated they're worth about $50,000. Hmm. And I got three different bids on them, 42,000, 47,000, and 49,700. Now, why the disparity? Well, people don't know what the purity is, and then they have to assay it, then they have to look at it. And then, you know, so we sold them back to the people she bought them from, and we had a certificate, and so they said it took eight weeks. Wow. Now, think if you're an average, moderate That's income right. person, you couldn't afford to keep your money tied up for eight weeks. But if you could have the gold and you wouldn't know where to store it, you probably don't even have a safe in your house. Right. But an average person could have their gold held by a state on deposit that's their actual gold, two ounces of gold that you own, that's four, about $4,000, and they could spend it if the washing machine broke down using a MasterCard or an American Express or a debit card. That becomes very useful means to store value. That's why Democrats loved it. It's economic justice. That's why we use the term economic justice in the book because we heard it over and over and over. When we released the book, we had a, at a Liberty Hawk Ranch here in Dallas, we invited uh, legislators from varying states, including one, uh, Senator Kevin McCabe from your state came and they all came in with different views. Well, maybe we should use gold backs or maybe we should do this or maybe we should, when they left, they were uniform. This is mm. the answer. I wrote the book, gave them all copies of the book. They've gone home and it is now spread to 18 states with legislation. We think we can pass it in almost every state in the United States. And we love that federalism because maybe Alaska does it right, but California doesn't do it so right. And if I live in California, I can have a banking relationship in Alaska or South Dakota or Florida or Texas. I, I might, as a Californian, prefer my money be held in Alaska and my gold be held in Alaska. So 50 experiments, 50 shots on gold, the one that is most liberty-minded is the one that will garner the most resources, and that will yeah. benefit that state. Which is a huge opportunity for a state, right? States are always looking for a competitive advantage where as the, the design was set up to compete with other states. You have different cultures, different economies, different things you can offer. One of the other things I really hear you saying um, on our show, we try to be really solution oriented. We don't think there's much point in a nation of sofa surfers. We want to be a people who are mobilized to do something. What I really like in the solution you're offering is you didn't just write a book and then impose it on everybody. Um, what I really hear and what you've done is this has all come out of best thinking from a lot of different people, which is why it's so persuasive. You get into these rooms and you're taking the best ideas and the best implementation and then giving the liberty and freedom to people to say, these are the basic principles. Implement it the way it works best in Alaska, in Texas, in Montana, in Virginia. I know you were just there. Um, what works best for your context, but these are the principles that will work best. Government control does not work best. Individual liberty does. And like you said, um, what's not working for us right now, for example, is all of our retirees retired on a certain income with a dollar base at a certain value. And now that that value of the dollar is dropping out from under them, that is economic injustice. And when you take away economic freedom from people, you're really putting them in a sort of government captivity that undermines the complete purpose of our country. Um, and it's an urgency that we really need to deal with. No, no question. And each state has the opportunity to make a little money because they can pick right. up some of the fees. Um, and it's all constitutionally supported by Supreme Court decisions. They're all, I, I put and cite the major cases in pirate money. There's no flaw here. I, I'm going to South Carolina, Utah. Uh, I'd love to come to Alaska and talk about it. I've been to Virginia, as you mentioned, Florida. I'm gonna go from here and meet the Lieutenant Governor of Texas and carry him a copy of the book. We'll go anywhere and support because we are a solutions to action tank. Economic War Room is not a think tank. We're not a talking head show. We are like you're doing, Kelly. We're mm -hmm. a solutions to action. We come up with solutions and then we'll take action 
to help implement the solution. We've already done this with artificial intelligence. We've already done this with a border solution. We're already doing it with solutions for ESG and proxy voting and all of those things. So we have these solutions, we have, and we're, we're out there working hard with great people like you to try and implement the solutions so that real people can actually benefit and not just watch a talking head complain about what's wrong. Right. <laughs> I love, part of what I love about this is when you talk about economic justice, I mean, this is also something that uh, advances the cause of uh, equality across the board, across race and gender, et cetera, because uh, when when impoverished communities lose their what little purchasing power they have, it makes their already challenging circumstances that much more challenging. And the solution you're proposing protects the value uh, of their of their money so that their purchasing power doesn't dwindle. Um, and so I've, I've, it's just a it's a powerful solution. So let's go back a little bit to the the history of this i just like to ask when you uh when we go back to the beginning republicans and democrats uh i mean this this was an issue that divided them and republicans mm -hmm. want a gold-based currency democrats didn't how did america get away from a standard that was outlined as you mentioned in our constitution and then how do we now hold our elected officials accountable uh, to issues like this and, and pushing this forward? Well, I'll blame two, a, a Democrat and a Republican. FDR confiscated gold in 1933 and right. removed us from the first part of the gold standard. Richard Nixon took us off the last part of the gold standard in 1971. In 1971, from that day to the present, I was 10 years old, I could buy a Hershey bar for a dime, I could buy a Slurpee for 15 cents, I could buy a Spider-Man comic for 15 cents, a cheeseburger, chocolate shake and fries at McDonald's for a dollar. Total, I could earn a dollar 60 in one hour's work. I could spend a dollar 40 on all those things that I just mentioned, and I had enough left over to pay my tithe. Or it shouldn't have been left over. I paid my tithe first, and then I had enough left over <laughs> to eat and enjoy all the good things in one hour's labor as a 10 year old. But what happened in 1971 is Richard Nixon created the opportunity for the financialization of the entire economy to where we have money making money rather than people making things that make money. And we lost our manufacturing base. Wall Street became predominant. They bought off all the politicians. And that's how we went from being a real economy to a fake money economy, which is where we are today. And so if I can wake up the populace and realize this isn't Democrat or Republican, That's right. this is a real people versus the elites that are running everything, they get it. And the way to take them back is education and the way to educate them is pirate money. If I can get you to read, Nick Vujicic wrote the uh, forward to it. Nick is a dear friend. You got to hear his story. It's in there. He got debanked. A man without arms or legs got debanked. Uh, he's a brilliant, beautiful man. It's got great endorsements. Ben Carson wrote the very first endorsement here. If you'll read the forward by Nick Vujicic, I think you'll read the introduction. If you read the introduction, I'm certain you'll read the first chapter. If you read the first <laughs> chapter, you read the whole book, and I and I have you on my team. Read the book. I know you'll buy. I know you'll buy into it, and you'll love it. That's really good. Um, so, Nick is amazing. We do know him, and this is an awesome book. So we totally endorse and recommend it. You can get it on Amazon, Pirate Money, or check out Kevin's website, EconomicWarRoom.com. We appreciate your wisdom. We appreciate your courage, Kevin, and everything you've shared today. Taking a stand for economic freedom and helping us out here in America. Um, this is amazing. Pirate Money is good, and we totally hope everybody adopts this, reads the book, and gets empowered. This has been another fantastic episode on Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. You can follow us on your favorite podcast platform. You can get all of our links at standshow.org. We will see you next week.